Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. In the aftermath of Israel's assassination of an Iranian nuclear scientist, Iran has announced that it will resume uranium enrichment to 20%, the same level it was before the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Iran has also issued a deadline of February for sanctions to be lifted or have nuclear inspectors banned from the country. Well, joining me is Scott Ritter. He is a former UN weapons inspector, a former Marine Corps intelligence officer, and author of Deal Breaker, Donald Trump and the Unmaking of the Iran Nuclear Deal. Scott, welcome to Pushback. Thank you very much for having me. What should people know about Iran's decision today to resume enrichment to 20%? Some are calling this a new crisis. Well, the first thing we need to realize is that it's nothing new in terms of the Iranian program. Uh, prior to the 2015 um, the, the coming into force of the of the uh, JCPOA, Iran was enriching um, uranium to 20 percent for use in a uh, research reactor in Tehran that produced medical isotopes. Um, they also need to understand that when we say Iran is uh, enriching to 20%. That doesn't mean that every centrifuge is enriching to 20%. It means that a selected cascade is doing a limited amount of enrichment to produce uh, uranium necessary to convert to fuel that can be used in this reactor. Other, the vast majority of the uh, centrifuges are enriching to the 3.5% necessary to produce fuel for uh, the nuclear reactors. Uh, the other thing that people need to understand is that um, this action by Iran is in conformity with the JCPOA. Not that the JCPOA permits this, but Articles 26 and 36 of the JCPOA permit Iran to walk back from its uh, commitments under the JCPOA so long as other members to the agreement are not in compliance. The United States not only withdrew from it, uh, but threatened secondary sanctions against Europe, the, the French, the Germans, the European Union, if they did business with Iran and European economic interaction with Iran is a part of the JCPOA. Europe has not lived up to its obligations. Therefore, Iran has, since May of 2019, been gradually walking back. And what we what we see now is Iran is virtually back to ground zero. I still believe that the, they're allowing the additional protocol uh, enhanced inspections to take place, but this too is on the chopping block. Mm -hmm. Um, in the future if, uh, if the nations don't come into compliance. It's not a new crisis in terms that Iran is, uh, you know, on, in a breakout scenario. It just means that the JCPOA is falling apart, largely because of American, uh, you know, the, the American withdrawal and European noncompliance. So let's talk about who this assassinated scientist was, uh, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. I probably pronounced that wrong. You can correct me. The New, York, oh, okay. <laughs> the, the, uh, the New York Times describes him as, quote, the force behind Iran's nuclear weapons program. Is that accurate? He is, first of all, first and foremost, understand that he's a child of the revolution. He was a teenager in 1979, and he joined the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Command uh, and, um, and participated in the revolution. But he's also an academic, and he went on to get his Ph.D., in, uh, in, 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 a, in a nuclear field and, um, you know, is, 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 is a renowned academic. Sometime around 1998, uh, he took over um, a procurement activity that's been ongoing since 1993 on behalf of Shahid University, which was seeking to get a bench scale centrifuge operation up and running for research and development. That means a single centrifuge, uh, it, you know, operating so that people could understand centrifuge dynamics. Uh, Europe and the United States were opposed to this. Much of the procurement activity was uh, had to become covert in nature, and the university simply wasn't up to the task. Uh, Fakhrizadeh took over this program in 1998, and from 1998 to 2003, um, you know, was the mastermind behind uh, Iran's covert procurement activities that allowed it to acquire the technology necessary to build the Natanz uranium enrichment plant. Uh, and, and, and to produce the IR-1 centrifuges that are the centerpiece of this enrichment plant. Um, but this is it. This is the extent of his uh, uh, activity in the nuclear field. He's not a weapons designer. 
uh, he, he isn't the Robert Oppenheimer of, of the Iranian program. He's the man who jump-started their program in terms of the, the procurement of this material. But there were other scientists that actually assembled it, put the, center, the, the centrifuge cascades together, built and designed Natanz, Ferno, mm -hmm. and the other activities. This, you know, Iran is, is not a nation that's dependent upon any single uh, person. Uh, especially not Fakhrizadeh. He's he's well regarded. He's a hero in the eyes of the Iranians. But um, you know his assassination, while tragic uh, for his family, for Iran, uh, does not set back the Iranian program whatsoever. But just to be clear, when the New York Times presumes that there is a Iranian nuclear weapons program, is that accurate? No, absolutely not. I mean, we, 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 we know it's not. Uh, even in the lead up to the 2015 JCPOA, uh, the United States and Israel put, you know, were, were disseminating intelligence that suggested a program, but there was no physical evidence. There was no proof, no smoking gun. It was documents in the form of forged documents, uh, documents coming from a laptop of uh, questionable provenance, uh, and just speculation on the part of the CIA uh, and Israeli intelligence about you know the fact that since Iran is seeking to procure uranium enrichment capability covertly, uh, therefore it must be that two plus two equals four. Covert procurement equals a covert military program with no evidence that such a military program existed. In 2015, as part of the JCPOA, Iran cooperated fully with the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency answering all the questions put forward about the possible military dimensions of their program. And the IAEA came back and said that we have no evidence that there's a, uh, a, a military program. Uh, we can't say with certainty that there isn't one, but we have no evidence that one exists. And this is the state of play that exists today. Israel and the United States, and frankly speaking, the New York Times, uh, reinventing a story that has been largely disproven that Iran has a nuclear weapons program is simply part of the overall propaganda effort underway to demonize Iran and probably uh, you know, pave the way towards psychological preparation of the American people for the potential of conflict with Iran over a non-existent nuclear weapons program. Then there's the question of why doesn't Iran have a nuclear weapons program? You have people like the late Kenneth Waltz, a well-known international relations scholar. He wrote a famous piece in Foreign Affairs in 2012 called Why Iran Should Get the Bomb. Nuclear balancing would mean stability. And certainly Iran, you know, seeing its people assassinated from uh, Qasem Soleimani to now a top nuclear scientist, you can make the argument that it would be in their best interest to have a nuclear weapon to help deter the constant U.S. attacks as well and Israeli attacks, as well as the crippling U.S. sanctions on them. That maybe that this would be the only way for them to uh, defend themselves from constant uh, U.S. and Israeli aggression. So why doesn't Iran have a nuclear weapons program? Well, contrary to what uh, what, what, the, what other people think, um, if Iran was actually pursuing a nuclear weapons program, it would be inviting its own destruction two, in two ways. Uh, we go back to 1988 uh, during the Iran-Iraq war when the Iranians had suffered uh, serious setbacks on the battlefield. And the Supreme Leader um, Khomeini uh, asked, his, asked the military and the Revolutionary Guard Command, what would it take to win this war, to turn things around? Uh, because Iran was suffering tremendously, l losing large casualties on the battlefield. Its economy was in shatters. He said, what, what does it need? And the, the Revolutionary Guard Command uh, staff came back with a, a list and, you know, things such as general mobilization, um, which would be economically devastating. Uh, and then Iran would have to buy uh, all new weaponry from China, from the Soviet Union and elsewhere to re-equip its forces. And lastly, Iran would have to produce chemical weapons and a nuclear weapon to offset Iraq's chemical weapons and Iraq's nuclear weapons program. The, the Iranians said it, Iraq is heading towards development of a nuclear weapon. If we don't have one, then we can't continue this war. Um, and the Supreme Leader said, we can't do that. Uh, possessing these weapons is against Islam. It's against Islamic belief. It's against our faith. Um, I have issued a fatwa, a religious edict that uh, prohibits this. Uh, we can't do it. And 
This is a man who hated Saddam Hussein, hated Iraq for invading his country. And he said, I am compelled to drink this cup of poison, meaning a peace agreement with Iraq, because he could not tolerate the conditions necessary to wage war with Iraq. And one of those was acquiring a nuclear device. It's just against the Islamic Republic. And should the, you know, when the Supreme Leader issues a fatwa, this is very serious. This is the equivalent of the Constitution of the United States. If an American says, hey, we're willing to deviate from the Constitution to do something, that means America is no longer America because the Constitution, if it lacks meaning, America lacks meaning because the Constitution defines it. Islam defines the Islamic Republic. And if Iran was to move forward with a nuclear weapon in the face of multiple fatwas uh, by both Khomeini and Khatame that say this is against Islamic principles, against what the Islamic Republic stands for, then the Islamic Republic would cease to exist. Second, there's no way you could develop a bomb without being detected. And Israel and the United States will not allow Iran to have a bomb. I can guarantee that. If Iran was heading towards a weapon, we would be bombing them today, we would be invading their country, we would be slaughtering them because the United States has demonstrated it's willing to go to war to defend Israel. And if Iran was developing a nuclear weapon, Israel would view this as an existential threat to its survival, and there would be a war, an all-out war, that would destroy Iran. And Iran knows this. There is no safety behind a nuclear weapon because before you can have a nuclear weapon, you have to build it, you have to develop it. And Iran's not on that page. Israel knows this, the United States knows this. That's why all this is just nonsense, what's going on. Israel just simply cannot tolerate a uranium enrichment program of any scale because Israel believes that if you have a uranium enrichment program that can enrich uranium for peaceful nuclear uh, energy, that same program could be configured to produce uranium for an atomic weapon. Therefore, Israel's not willing to take the risk and they want everything gone. And that's what they're pushing for. Israel knows that there is no nuclear weapons program in Iran because if there is one, we wouldn't be talking today about the potential of a war We'd be talking about Israel bombs, Israeli bombs landing on Iranian soil. But if Israel knows that Iran has no nuclear weapons program, is this just about them taking all steps possible to prevent a future risk that could come from Iran being able to enrich uranium? Or are they going for, is it, for, is it more than that? Are they actually trying to just provoke a war? Because whether Iran has a program or not, they just want to destroy Iran. They want to wipe it out. Well, Israel knows it can't wipe Iran out, just like Iran knows it can't wipe Israel out. I mean, they, it, it just, Iran's too big. Um, and the Iranians, frankly speaking, have enough ballistic missile capacity to um, severely damage Israel, uh, to destroy its viability as a nation state, even though there wouldn't be a nuclear weapon used. Israel knows this. Um, and Iran knows that Israel can destroy its economic viability by targeting, you know, the, 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 you know its, its industrial infrastructure. What Israel is going for is to make the JCPOA go away. What Israel wants is an Iran nuclear agreement that does away with Iran's enrichment program. That's why they backed Donald Trump's policies of not attacking Iran, but of compelling Iran to return to a negotiating table to renegotiate this deal, this what Donald Trump calls this bad deal, so that there is no uranium enrichment program. That's what Israel's objectives are, to get rid of the uranium enrichment program. And it does that by getting rid of the JCPOA. And that's what its goals are. The assassination of the scientists was an effort to throw a monkey wrench into Joe Biden's aspirations of perhaps rejoining the JCPOA. Uh, Israel's goal, and I believe it's the goal of the Trump administration, is to make it impossible for the United States to rejoin the JCPOA, uh, to have Joe Biden continue a policy of sanctions-based um, uh, suppression of, of Iran to, to get Iran to return to the negotiating table. And if you talk, listen to what Joe Biden's been saying, that's what he wants. Even though he says he wants to rejoin the JCPOA, he says that's only as the first step towards a new round of negotiations, which would put further constraints on Iran's nuclear program, up to and including the elimination of Iran's uh, indigenous uranium enrichment capacity. And do you think Iran would ever agree to that? No, Iran's made it clear. Look, if Iran was going to agree to that, they would have agreed to it 
a long time ago, back in the early 2000s. But Iran stood firm for close to 13 years, from 2002 to 2015, withstanding all the sanctions that could be thrown at it, willing to go to war to defend their right uh, of uranium enrichment, because Iran's not joking when they say their economic future is dependent upon getting a indigenous nuclear power uh, capacity installed that frees up oil so it can be exported to generate income necessary to keep the Iranian, Iranian economy growing. That's why they. That's why the Shah wanted nuclear energy back in the 1970s, and that's why the Islamic Republic uh, decided that it needed to re-embrace nuclear power in the in the 1990s. Uh, so then, oh, let me ask you. So wait, is that then Israel and the U.S. is a real target? The prospects of a bigger uh, and self, more self-sustaining Iran economy. No, not necessarily, uh, because the, neither Israel nor the United States has said that Iran can't have nuclear power. Um, they're, they're very content with letting Iran build as many nuclear reactors as they want, as long as the fuel comes from somewhere else, as long as there is no uh, indigenous reprocessing capability, so long as the spent fuel is removed from Iran, Iran can have as much nuclear energy as they want. The problem is everything I just outlined is in nonconformity with the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which Iran is a signatory to. Article 4 clearly allows Iran to have not only a nuclear power capability, but an indigenous fuel production capability to, 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 uh, to fuel up the, these reactors. That's, but, you know, that's what Israel and the United States want. I think both parties recognize that Iran plays a very important role in the region economically uh, and in that a peaceful Iran with a vibrant economy is a positive for the region, not a negative. Well, I, I have that view, but I'm not sure that U.S. and Israeli planners do, because a strong Iran is also a deterrent to U.S. and Israeli hegemony in the region, which I, I think is a factor here. Oh, there's no doubt that the U.S. and Israel are concerned about Iran's regional prowess, uh, what they call the, the the malign activities of the Iranian regime in places like Lebanon. And that's a real problem for Israel because Hezbollah proved in 2006 it can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Israeli army. And if anything, Hezbollah has gotten better since then, and the Israeli army has gotten worse. Um, so, you know, Iran's support of Hezbollah is a, is, a, is a big problem. Iran's support of the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad is a big problem. Uh, Iran's support of the Houthi uh, rebellion in Yemen is a big problem. Iran's support of, um, you know, the Taliban in Afghanistan is a big problem. But um, a problem for the U.S. for its ability for the, to for the yeah. U.S. and for and for Israel. Yeah. I mean, at least it's it's perceived to be uh, a problem. The the reality is, uh, if, if if the U.S. put on its uh, hat, I mean, the one area that that I, I think everybody can agree with is that Hezbollah poses a threat to Israel. Um, but that's Israel's fault, not Hezbollah's fault. Uh, Israel invaded Lebanon, created the conditions that created Hezbollah, and you know, continue to view Lebanon as sort of a, a punching bag. Um, so in, in order to get rid of Hezbollah, the first thing Israel has to do is treat Lebanon with respect. It doesn't. Uh, Syria is a sovereign nation that was getting ready to fall to the Islamic State and to uh, you know, al-Nusra and al-Qaeda. The black flag was going to be raised over Damascus. It was Iranian intervention followed by Russian intervention that salvaged the Syrian regime. Uh, and the United States and Israel should both be thankful that Bashar al-Assad is still in power and not some... Uh, you know, uh, Islamic uh, caliphate. Um, in Iraq, you know, the United States created the problem in Iraq by invading and getting rid of Saddam Hussein. Iran filled that vacuum um, and, and put in a government that is sympathetic to Iranian concerns. Um, but that's not a threat to Israel. It just happens to be something that uh, it is in opposition to U.S. policy objectives. And in Yemen, uh, I mean, history shows that it was Saudi Arabia who invaded, Saudi Arabia who's committed the atrocities, Saudi Arabia who initiated the conflict, and the Houthi are simply defending themselves. Uh, Iran's support of the Houthi gives them a certain uh, lethality on the battlefield that's helped turn the tide against Saudi Arabia. But uh, to say that this is an existential threat to anyone is absurd. It's about defending Yemen. So these are exaggerations on the part of the United States. Um, Iran can be brought back into the fold of the so-called family of nations simply by treating Iran with the respect that it deserves as a major power in the Middle East. It doesn't mean that everybody bows to Iran. It means that people have to start understanding that Iran has interests in the region and Iran will defend those interests. And the key to getting along peacefully is finding a way to ensure 
that all interests are respected and where there are difficulties or where, where, where there's disagreement, that it's resolved peacefully, diplomatically, and not through violence. Okay, Iran so, didn't draw the sword first. Right. Saudi right, Arabia right. drew the sword. Israel drew the sword. The United States drew the sword. Right. Iran's simply right. responding. Okay, so on that okay. front, what do you think Biden should do when he comes into office? And what do you think he actually will do when it comes to Iran? Well, I, I mean, the most important thing he should do is, is return to the JCPOA. Um, I, that, that's just an absolute. Uh, to bring things back to May 2018, when uh, Donald Trump precipitously withdrew from that agreement. Uh, he can't do that because the domestic uh, politics uh, are, are too poison. Um, the, 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 the feeling that Iran's nuclear program is out of control, um, yielding the initiative to Iran, um, you know, give, uh, empowering Iran financially so that their malign activities can now be funded, their ballistic missile programs can be funded. Um, you know, this is the mindset in Washington, D.C. and in Israel. And this is why, uh, you know, there's no way Joe Biden could go back to the JCPOA because to, to liberate the Iranian economy would feed all the conspiracy theories that exist about, you know, Iran's malign intent. Um, he might be able to strike a, a, a compromise where, because remember, it's not just Iran that uh, Joe Biden has to focus on. He has to repair relations with Europe. And Europe is still very angry at the United States for these secondary sanctions. And one of the best ways that uh, Joe Biden can become a good ally to Europe is to allow Europe to abide by its obligations under the JCPOA, allow Europe to trade with Iran, to stop this program of secondary sanctions. That might be the best that Iran could hope for in the short term. In the long term, Iran is going to have to figure out how to, um, to, to, to mollify uh, American and Israeli and regional concerns about uh, its activities in Syria and Lebanon and Yemen and its ballistic missile activities. Uh, there, there's going to have to be some sort of negotiations uh, there that um, that convince people that Iran is not the threat that somehow controls or contains uh, the threat posed by Iran's ag regional activities and its ballistic missile program. Um, if that happens, then I can see the United States moving towards rejoining the JCPOA. But uh, there's other things that have to be talked about. The um, you know the the sunset clauses that that. Uh, you know, basically allow Iran in, in, a, in, a, in a number of years to have as many centrifuges of however much quality they want, producing as much uranium as they want. Um, that will never be acceptable to Israel, and it won't be acceptable to the United States. Even Barack Obama, who created this, this agreement, understood that this agreement was never going to last. I mean, he said, all we're doing is buying ourselves time. That's what the purpose of the sunset uh, clauses were buying time, not to allow the sunset clauses to expire in Iran to actually have this capability, but buying time to improve relations with Iran so that there could be follow-on discussions that eliminated Iran's uranium enrich enrichment program, or at least put so much constraints on it that it wasn't seen as a threat by Israel. The United States never intended to allow this agreement to reach maturity. It couldn't. It couldn't allow because the whole purpose was to prevent the, the one-year breakout window. But once the sunset clauses are gone, that breakout window is reduced to a matter of days, if not weeks. That's unacceptable to the United States. They've said that's a red line. So the agreement was never going to succeed. Um, in many ways, Donald Trump did the world a favor by you know, pointing out that reality, that it just wasn't going to be a viable agreement. And Iran needs to understand that at some point in time, it's going to have to sit down and... Um, and re-enter negotiations with the West so that it can, you know, get on with uh, life without sanctions. But what would you say to someone in Iran who says, why should we negotiate with the U.S.? How can we trust them? They kill our top officials. They've imposed murderous sanctions on us. You know, you can go back decades. There's the, you know, U.S. support for Saddam Hussein in the Iraq war, as we talked about before. There's a whole list of grievances culminating now and now in what Trump has done. So what's your argument to an Iranian who says, why should we negotiate with these people at all? Well, first of all, I, 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 I wouldn't dare get in an argument with them because I agree with them. The United States is an unworthy, uh, an unworthy uh, negotiating partner. I wouldn't believe a word the United States says because the United States has never been up front with Iran. There's always a hidden agenda. There's always the Israeli agenda that takes prominence. Um, so 
you know, it, it's hard for me to to sit there and try and argue to an Iranian why he should trust, he or she should trust the United States, except to say that at some point in time, Iran's going to have to figure out a diplomatic path, an off-ramp off of, you know, off of this confrontation. I'm not saying the United States is a worthy negotiating partner, but right now, the only way out of this is to negotiate with the United States. Um, and you're going to have, Iran's going to have to find out a, a way to do this. I would never trust the United States again, ever. Yeah. And I would ensure whatever agreement is negotiated has enough back. So look, the Iranians negotiated, were genius in this. Articles 26 and 36 that allow Iran to do what they're doing today legally were actually, you know, the United States was insisting on these because the United States wanted to use those articles for snap back inspections. But the Iranians masterfully turned it around so that it applied both ways. So that when the United States withdrew and Iran knew they were going to withdraw, I'll go back to the parliamentarian discussions before the agreement was uh, inked in July and listen to what they were saying. Even the Supreme Leader said, we can never trust the United States. They will never live up to this agreement. So they ensured that they were positioned to behave accordingly, not to be trapped uh, by, by the uh, JCPOA. Uh, they're masterful negotiators. These are very mature people. And I'm, I don't have to tell them anything. They know what the facts are but they will have to negotiate with the United States at some point. One proposal, which never gets discussed in the U.S., but it does get discussed uh, on the global stage, there was a recent U.N. conference about it, is to have a nuclear weapons-free Middle East, which would mean Israel no longer having nuclear weapons. Would that solve this problem easily if that could ever be achieved? Ed, doubtful, um, because nuclear weapons, in, in order to have a nuclear-free uh, Middle East, you got to have a nuclear-free world. I mean, at the end of the day, you got to back this nuclear genie all the way back up, you know, and, and, and reverse it in China, Pakistan, uh, reverse it in Russia, reverse it in the United States, reverse it in France and Great Britain. Um, you know, all the uh, North Korea would have to abandon its program. Uh, as long as there's one nuclear weapon in possession of one country, there will always be uh, the, the feeling by other nations that they need a nuclear weapon to, um, to, to survive. Uh, I mean, the North Korean example is, 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 is first and foremost. I mean, without the nuclear weapons program, without nuclear weapons, North Korea wouldn't have the ability to, to, to taunt the United States, to stand up and, and, and you know, disregard the will of America. Um, it's its nuclear weapons that give it the, its survivability. Uh, Iran doesn't pursue it because, again, uh, that would be against the very tenets of what the Islamic Republic stands for, and it wouldn't exist should they pursue it. But other nations, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, um, you know, these are nations that um, have long said that they, they might need to have nuclear weapons. And even if you don't have a, you know, who's going to trust Israel? Uh, who's, you know, nobody trusts Iran, and they don't even have a nuclear weapons program. Um, you know, Israel would have to agree to a, a level of inspection activity that it just it would be intolerable for the Israelis. They're so arrogant um, and, and they're so fearful. Uh, so, you know, even hypothetically, if it existed, I, I think as long as there's a nuclear weapon on the planet, it's going to be difficult to talk about, you know, a nuclear free zone anywhere in the world, because there will always be somebody that says we need a nuclear weapon to match their nuclear weapons capability. All right. Scott Ritter, former U.N. weapons inspector, former Marine Corps intelligence officer, author of Deal Breaker, Donald Trump and the unmaking of the Iran nuclear deal. Scott, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.